Well, my full-time job is I'm a newspaper columnist, and so I write about America's problems. <laughs> and a lot of the problems I was covering all had one root, and that was the tearing of our social fabric. You run across these statistics, 54% of Americans say no one knows them well. The number of people who say they have no close friends has quadrupled. You see rising opioid addictions, all these rising social problems. Our nation right now is being faced with what I would call the silent crisis, and it's the crisis of trust. But there are people, which we call weavers, who are out there rebuilding trust, rebuilding communities. Weave origins happened by David Brooks. David was invited to a Thursday night dinner at a family, and he saw how this family was showing up for the young people around the table. I walk in the room, and there's 40 people around the table, mostly high school age, a bunch of mattresses for the kids who are staying over, and we formed this little forged family for the next five years, so I ate with them every Thursday night. We took vacations together. That was my experience of weaving. Well, I didn't even know what a weaver was, but I was in the middle of a couple of them. And he goes, there has to be something to that. Like, are there other people who are doing this? And so the purpose of weave was like, what can we do to help these people out? What can we do to get more people to be weavers? Well, the Aspen Institute is about convening people. And so I said, you bring people together. And we're in a crisis of togetherness, so this should be your mission. We call them weavers because if you think about the idea of weaving something together, and so what our weavers are doing is knitting together, weaving together their communities around the country. It's easiest to, when you see it. In Watts, it was a woman named Keisha Daniels who runs something called Sisters of Watts. Just a bunch of moms who, when a kid has, needs some food for, to take home, they give them a backpack full of food. One of the weavers that we found really inspiring is Megan Helberg from Taylor, Nebraska. She's one of the educators who left to go get a college degree in a big city, but decided to come back home because she felt this inkling to come back and help make the place she grew up better. One of the things that I find true of educators is this skill of seeing others and being deeply seen, something teachers are just good at. What qualifies a weaver educators are people who go beyond what the normal day job is. I have a friend who says teaching is a community of truth. We're in the classroom together and we're trying to find the truth together. It's not me lecturing at you, it's we're discovering together. Turning a classroom into a community is, is what teachers are all about. Another inspiring weaver educator is Heidi Maxey in Hawaii. Heidi saw that the students at our school had a myriad of issues um, and through an angel fund started picking up all these projects to help support the needs. So if you go to our high school, you'll see um, clothing, um, you'll see a place for young people to decompress, you'll see all these different projects all meeting the needs of her community, which is the school. Our theory is that culture changes when a small group of people find a better way to live and the rest of us copy. And so if you read about a story about a weaver or, or see a video about a weaver, you think, wow, that's an amazing person. I may be that not, not that amazing, but I can be a little more amazing. And then the second thing Weave tries to do is we give them resources. We have these things called Weaver Awards. We launched a project in Baltimore um, last year um, to give funding, micro grants to local weavers so that they can do their work without a lot of the hassle. And they're not large grants, but enough to make a difference in a small organization. And then a lot of weavers, a lot of people are really building community, they're exhausted. They're, so many community needs are thrust in their lap. They often don't have anybody to talk to. Uh, nobody's trained them to do this work. And so by bringing weavers together with each other, then they uh, can educate each other. They can say, this is what I do, what do you do? And so it's mutual support. There's a woman named Sarah Hemminger who runs an organization called Thread in Baltimore which is sort of a community organization to surrounding teenagers in, in Baltimore. And she leapt into action and started this food bank and this food distribution network. And I talked to her, this was early COVID, and she said, I was born for this. I look at the young generation, the, the group that was most enthusiastic about Weave, as we would present it, was high school students. And they're at a point in their life where they want to contribute, they're filled with moral passion, and they get the crisis of connection firsthand. There's a lot of loneliness and rivalry in high school. Incredibly hope-giving. 
I took on this role last two years ago at the top of the pandemic. But as our work persisted, um, I started hearing the stories of people who are really figuring out how to show up for people. And I think in a way has reminded me of, of the responsibility I have to show up for people and not just where I work, but also what I do after work as well. Those of us in journalism, we think our job is to explain how bad everything is and not focus on the people who are fixing it. But what gives me hope is the fact that those people are just sprinkled throughout society of all different types and shapes and colors and creeds, and they're out there.